there's a lot of whys that we're going to talk about today. Why DevOps? Why security? What are we supposed to do about it? Um, so we'll just dive in. First things first, why does DevOps matter? Any, this is going to be a very like, interactive talk. Why does DevOps matter, anyone? Doing things faster, faster, faster. Doing things faster, faster, faster. Which means faster time to market. Which means faster time to market. <laughs> One more time. Making it easier to reproduce what you did. Responsibilities. Responsibilities. We can deliver more products to our customers. Yes, all of these things. All these things. These are business reasons, right? Yes. It allows you to be faster than your competition. You got to be faster than the competition. How else are you going to survive? Yes. Better communication between teams. Better communication between teams. Yes, yes very much so. Businesses do what they need to do in order to survive and succeed. So DevOps companies, I don't think they necessarily have all the answers, but they are inherently flexible. They can iterate according to market feedback and business needs. Um, as everyone has said, the faster you can go, the less you spend on product development, the fewer person hours are required to deliver a complete solution. Every iteration is an opportunity to deliver greater business value. So DevOps is great. DevOps is going to save all of our organizations. DevOps is going to give us this tremendous competitive advantage. Um, I want to do a reality check and say, let's be real about where we are. DevOps is still the new cool thing, which means it's not totally mainstream. Puppet has been publishing its State of DevOps report for three years now, and the 2017 version of that report says that 27% 20 of organizations have made the switch. That means that there are, not, I'm not really good at math on the spot, 73% uh, that have not. Right? So the vast majority of organizations have not made the switch. Um, Gartner also has published a number that says 25% of global 2,000 organizations have adopted DevOps. So why is this word all over the place? Uh, you might think that everyone is using a DevOps model except for you, um, but even if most organizations are thinking about making the switch, uh, many haven't yet. Uh, and in my experience working with DevOps teams, uh, they're either teams that were born in DevOps um, or an organization which has a component which is sort of trying DevOps out. So I think it's great that we have meetings like this to talk about this stuff because there's still an awful lot that needs to be figured out. I think that's, that's what is very exciting about this space. Um, I also want to, as part of this reality check, talk about automation. There's a lot of cool things that automation can do, but let's not forget that the only things that can be automated are the things that we already know how to do, and we've gotten to such a standard process that we can do the same thing over and over again, and we can teach a computer program to do it. So when we talk about automation, the most commonly automated tests are integration tests, component and unit tests, performance tests. That being said, manual testing is still very popular for things like user acceptance tests, usability tests, and story level tests. Organizations are having a tough time automating everything, which makes perfect sense. There are, there are some things which rely on a human opinion, uh, and, and spending time and money trying to automate things that require a human opinion and a human brain uh, doesn't make sense. So there are things that are going to be automated, and there are things that are not going to be automated. And guess what? Your customers are human. So that's why when we talk about user acceptance and story level tests, these are the ones that are not automated. Um, and guess what? The people who are interested in attacking your software uh, are also human. <laughs> Uh, they're, not, they're not computers. So how is the role of security changing? You know, um, 
perhaps the folks in this room who are the DevOps folks rather than the security folks have come from an engineering background and not a security background, although those two are not entirely exclusive. Um, you know, you might be asking the question, well, we have a security team. Why won't they just take care of it? Um, of course, as we've discussed, in DevOps, developers have much more power and changes happen quickly, which means there's not always time for a traditional large-scale security review. Uh, that means it's critical for security to be built in to the development culture and also into the development and the deployment processes. So I want to talk about DevOps and how that's changed things for security people. So 10 years ago, and you know, it's all a spectrum, right? There's so many different organizations with so many different approaches, but generally speaking, there was an approach to security that said, we're an m, &M right? We're soft and squishy on the inside, melty, uh, and we've got this hard candy shell. And it's all about protecting the perimeter. Um, security would insert itself at various steps throughout the software development lifecycle um, and have an opportunity to review and improve things before they went on to the next step. That works great in a waterfall software development methodology. Um, another thing that we had was on-premise data centers, on-premise workforces who were using organization-issued mobile devices to do their work. So today, things look really different than they did 10 years ago when it comes to technology. So now we've got a vendor situation, right? My organization does not develop all of the software that it uses. We depend a lot on other organizations to help us build our product, uh, whether that means sending your code to GitHub or CodeShip. Um, you depend on other organizations um, using open source code. I know Black Duck is here. Um, you depend on code that's been written by someone else. And there's risk involved in that. And I say it goes both ways because most of our organizations are also vendors of some sort. If you're not a security vendor, you're selling something uh, if you're a business. And so your customer is now also going to have additional questions about your security. If you're hosted in the cloud, if you're using a DevOps methodology, why should I, as your potential customer, trust you? How do I know that by incorporating your product into mine that it's going to be secure. Um, because cloud has really changed the way that network and system infrastructure works, there's a bigger focus for security professionals on applications and particularly APIs. When infrastructure is code, then it's code security that matters. Uh, and finally, we've got mobile workforce, um, employees of organizations are everywhere, uh, and they're connecting with their own devices, um, which are not always totally controlled by the organization they work for. So the landscape is changing. Here's the next question for you guys, uh, which is why do you think that security matters for DevOps? It's too easy to ship bad code. And what happens when you ship bad code? Bad things happen. Bad things happen. And maybe in like DevOps words, unplanned work happens and rework happens, which of course takes the place of planned work, and then you don't get those benefits of DevOps that we talked about in the first place. Any other thoughts on why security matters for DevOps? Yes. Moving security left, fixing security issues sooner rather than later is cheaper. One more time. Yes, security is a part of quality. 
and it inspires people, perhaps it encourages people or requires people to write better quality code, including security. Yes, when you want to go fast, traditional security doesn't work. As we just discussed, the landscape is changing. Security needs to change too. Thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna actually talk about 10 companies who are killing it at DevOps. And for each one, I Googled it, and I looked to see where security featured on their web pages. So Adobe has a public-facing security statement. Adobe is a company that may or may not have had some security issues in the past, and they need to convince their customers and their users that indeed they are secure and security is a priority. This is a business imperative for Adobe. Facebook also has a security page. Similar reasons. Amazon, AWS cloud security, because how could AWS run unless the users believed that it was secure? Fidelity has a public-facing security page. Walmart, who knew that Walmart was a DevOps shop? But Tech Beacon says that it's one of the 10 companies killing it at DevOps. Etsy is like a yarn shop, right? But they had Zane Lackey and, you know, he did the whole DevOps security thing over there. Also, public-facing website, arguably marketing, using security as a competitive differentiator. Use our service. We want you to know that we're secure. Don't be afraid to use our service because you don't need to worry that we're not secure. Netflix. Target. CEO got fired shortly after the security breach. And this was a guy who had worked his way up Right? This is not like a new CEO who came in, a breach occurred, you know, person has moved out. This is someone who started out at like an entry level, made his way up, established a history at the organization. Security breach is one of probably a few things uh, that led to that person uh, being asked to leave the company. Sony. Nordstrom. So, I'm awfully pragmatic when it comes to why security matters. And there are really just three reasons, and I really just think it's one reason. So the first one, sales, support, and acquisition. If you're trying to sell a product and your customer or your acquirer wants to know what your security situation is, you better have a good answer. Number two. The company wants to avoid negative press headlines. We saw a few of those when we looked at the top 10 companies killing it at DevOps. The company wants to avoid negative press headlines resulting from a security breach. Well, let's think about that for a moment, because isn't the reason that any company cares about press because it doesn't want bad press to affect their sales or their potential acquisitions? Um, Verizon and Yahoo. I think Verizon got like a $480 million discount on their acquisition following the breach. So I think that means we're, we're really just back to one reason, which is sales and acquisition. And bad press is, is perhaps a part of that. Compliance. This is why I joined the eBay security team, because the company needed to comply with PCI and SOX, other organizations may need to comply with HIPAA. GDPR is becoming a thing. Or another requirement in order to do business or meet a customer requirement. I've actually heard of organizations that choose not to meet compliance requirements, again, as a business decision. Because it's a business trade-off to say, well, we need to invest X amount in order to be compliant. You know, and if we're not, the, the, the risk uh, is going to be Y amount, and so we're just going to take that business risk. At the end of the day, it's all about sales and survival and business. So there is another reason, 
Okay, so this is so this is weird. When you Google, when you're trying to do a presentation and you're trying to find a slide that shows a CISO sleeping at night, <laughs> you get all sorts of inappropriate images. <laughs> and so I chose this cat one to show like what's another reason for security? So your VP of engineering, so your director of DevOps, so your CISO can sleep at night. And I think again, that's because ultimately of sales. There's this idea that one should not put a $200 fence around a $5 asset. The whole reason DevOps exists is to help the business. The whole reason security exists is to help the business. So in 2002, Bill Gates sent out this memo. And it was about trustworthy computing. And if you read the media, it seems like an awfully noble cause. Let's take a look at some of the specific text in his memo. Over the last year, it has become clear that ensuring.net is a platform for trustworthy computing is more important than any other part of our work. If we don't do this, people simply won't be willing or able to take advantage of all the other great work that we do. So Bill Gates sent out this company-wide memo, and it's because Microsoft was starting to get questions about its security, and it didn't want security to get in the way of its sales. It's all about the money. I'm sorry? It's all about the Benjamins. There, are, I, I wish I could figure out a way to have like you know one five-second clip of a song play like right. And I'm sure there's a way to do that. I, I'm sure that I, I will figure it out for the next time that um, that I do this presentation. So what is a person supposed to do? So say you are a VP of engineering. Say you are a director of DevOps, and you have to go and do security. Where do you start? I've heard numbers like there's 8,000 security vendors. I've heard numbers like there's 14,000 security vendors. Even if you have an awfully open door policy when it comes to security vendors, there's no possible way that you could hear everyone's pitch and try and decide what it is that you need to do. So maybe you would look to frameworks and standards. There's a super cool framework called the BSIM. BSIM was started about nine years ago. It's a descriptive model of software security activities. And it has 112 controls. That's a lot of things to be able to have to do. That's a lot of things to even go through and decide which ones are we going to do. 112 control elements. This is an old slide. I actually think there's 113 now. So ISO, ISO makes standards. They make really good standards. ISO 27001, ISO 27002. There's a cloud version, which is ISO 27, 20, ISO 27017. And guess what? It costs $150 to even get the standard. BSIM is free. Um, I did the conversion on Google uh, from Swiss francs. And there are 121 control elements. How are you supposed to do that? So you could go to another organization called the Cloud Security Alliance, and you could look at their cloud controls matrix. 133 control elements. This is the job of a security policy analyst. Um, and I think there are like some people in the world who like going through this stuff. Um, I'm not one of those people even though I did do that job for a while. Um, and so it's enough to make a person's brain explode, right? Even if you are a security professional, even if you do have security background and experience. And if you are not, then it's just like, it's just too much. It's too much. So how can we simplify? Security for DevOps. Security is about preventing bad things from happening, because if you release 
low quality, insecure code, bad things will happen. What does it mean for a bad thing to happen? It means you're doing unplanned work, which means that you're taking time away from planned work, and it means that you're doing rework, which again, means that you're taking time away from planned work. It's also about trust. So somebody had mentioned that culture is a big part of DevOps. And I've been in enough organizations to see scenarios where the culture of a team works and people are actually working together and they actually trust each other. And I've seen scenarios where people don't trust each other. And what are some mistakes that security people make which result in other people not trusting security? When the security person walks in and says, look, we need to do security, here's a list of 133 things. And then the DevOps person says, clearly you don't understand how this works. And the business person says, clearly you don't understand how this works. So it's important to again remember that DevOps exists to support the business. Security exists to support the business. I think it's important for security professionals to spend as much time learning about the business and learning about their organization's flavor of DevOps just as much time as they spend learning about the latest security breach, the latest security vulnerability. So here's my simplification. Instead of 100 plus controls, there is this framework called the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. And I like it because it's easy to understand and it's very pragmatic. The approach is based on responding to an incident, which is the way that security actually affects organizations. In 2013, President Barack Obama issued an executive order titled Improving Critical Infrastructure Security. And it was all about enhancing the security and the re resilience of critical infrastructure and maintaining a cyber environment that encourages efficiency, innovation, and economic prosperity. So whereas security traditionally perhaps has been seen as a blocker and a stopper and a wait for -er, uh, and a delayer, um, this approach is different. This approach is saying, look, we need our critical infrastructure, and it can be extended to or other organizations and businesses to be efficient, innovative, and prosperous. So this executive order calls for the development of a voluntary risk-based cybersecurity framework, and here you go. These are sort of the five components, and I think it just makes sense, right? So I'm gonna even simplify it for you one step further and take it from five things to three. So we've gone from 133, 120, 113, down to five, and I'm gonna say we're going down to three. Three steps to doing security for DevOps. The first is to identify what's your business environment and what's your DevOps process. The second is to prevent. And there's an analogy that's been used in security that says, you know, doing security it's like taking a multivitamin. Doing security, it's like brushing your teeth. And that's fine, but the results of brushing your teeth, you know, they're not like so immediate. So I, I prefer an analogy that says, if your business depends on cars to deliver product on time, those cars need to have regularly scheduled maintenance. They need to have oil changes. Because if you take the time to do oil changes and regularly schedule maintenance, then you will prevent the car from breaking down and not being able to deliver whatever you need to deliver on time. So there's this concept of preventive maintenance. And what I really like about the NIST cybersecurity framework is it puts it in the context of an incident. So the, the remaining three components of the NIST cybersecurity framework are detect, respond, and recover. I've sort of bundled that together. 
and said, we're going to call that React. So we've got five minutes. Let's go through each of these. Number one, identify. Learn about the business. Again, DevOps exists to support the business. Security exists to support the business. Spend as much time learning about how your business works and about the DevOps process and tool chain as you spend learning about the latest security breach or vulnerability. It destroys trust when a security person walks into the room and talks about something that's either irrelevant or theoretical. That just, that just, that just doesn't, that doesn't work for this trust thing, right? A DevOps professional has to believe that a security professional is actually there to help them, not to get in their way, not to slow them down, not to prevent them from getting their work done. So learn the business, understand the business. How do you do that? Go to your business process owners and ask them what their objectives are. And then make a list of things that jeopardize those goals. Understand what the value chains are in your business. Link those business objectives to how technology jeopardizes it. Make sure you consider your supply chain. Who are your vendors? How are you connected to them? What are your dependencies? If your source code goes out to GitHub and CodeShip, you know, potentially you're giving them secrets. What secrets are you giving out? How do you manage those secrets? How do you connect to your backend database? How do you connect to your third party APIs? This is threat modeling. This is understanding how are your systems architected. Ask questions like, why do we trust GitHub? Why do we trust CodeShip? Why would our customer trust us? And eliminate scope where you can. So why process credit cards? If someone else, that's like all they do and they're really good at it. And then if you don't do it and they do it, then you don't have to deal with the security part. Or if you do process credit card information, other sensitive information, you know, keep it in one place so that you don't have to apply all your security controls all over the place. You can just apply them to, to that place where they are. Number two is prevent. So awareness is really important. Culture. What do DevOps people think about? So I started my career at eBay. I was there from 2005 to 2010. In 2014, there was a massive data breach. What happened? eBay employees were fished. And how do you prevent something like that from happening? Because there's all this tech, there's all this automation, there's all these controls, but at the end of the day, there are people who run your business. And what do these people know about security? And there are tons of organizations who will sell you, try and sell you, computer-based training. And there's some CBT that's great, and there's some CBT that's not great, and instructor-led training. And how much of that training is about those 130 cloud controls, that 120 ISO 27, 27017 controls, that 113 BSIM controls, how much of that training is theoretical and not relevant? Why not build your training based on actual incidents that have occurred at your organization? And every organization, if you're doing some logging and monitoring and alerting, has had incidents. And on top of that, maybe you're doing something like on-demand pen testing, and you're finding out real ways that real people could exploit your systems. Policy and procedures, you know, there's a place for these things in both the traditional security world as well as the DevOps security world. Um, things that matter a lot in DevOps, change management. Who's making what commits? Were those reviewed? Were those approved? Even if it's just by a peer and not, you know, some sort of ivory tower person, even if there's a whole set of changes that can happen and get automatically approved, you know, but there are these high risk changes that need to go through a change review board. Not every change needs to go through a change review board, but there are some that should. And what are those for your business? What are those critical, critical components that could cause something to blow up? Reducing technical debt. So this is where I get into like oil changes for your car. I am out of time. We're going to go super quick. Update your software, implement your vendor patches, figure out a way to do that. On-demand security testing. Uh, I talked to a director of DevOps, and he says, look, we do a lot of cool stuff. We work with vendors. We like to work with vendors to tell us that 
what we're doing is actually what we think we're doing, like writing secure code. React. This is about responding to an incident. Detecting, do you know when an incident's gonna occur? Logging, monitoring, alerting. Responding, do you have an incident response plan in place? What about your supply chain? And recovering. When you have an incident, how do you incorporate that into your prevention controls? Key takeaways. Security has to be business driven. It has to be on demand. It has to be built to fit a culture of trust. In closing, businesses will do what they need to do to survive and succeed. If their customers need agility, then they will evolve to accommodate that. Security needs to spend as much time, if not more, understanding the business so they can integrate and be effective. The difference when it comes to cloud and DevOps is that security can be a business driver as customers need assurance that the products and solutions they are buying and integrating are trustworthy and secure. Sorry for running over time. If you have questions, we should talk about them. Thank you.